All right, so let's talk about what we do. We already went through a lot of this. Your scene size up, that's an EMS term. Uh, another term is, you know, you, you're getting a good general first impression. That's a term that can go in there. I like size up. I size up everything, you know. You sort of look and you look at the surroundings and what's taking place in the surroundings. You look at the patient, you look at the family. You know, they're in, let's say they're in the hospital, you go in their room, you want to size it up, you want to see if the patient's mad or happy, right? You want to see if the family's upset, you want to do all these different things, all right? And that's just part of the size up. As you go through, you notice. Or another thing that you could put there with size up is good observation skills. You want to be very observant in what you're looking at as you're going through the hospital, uh, as you're in, in uh, you know, encountering patients and working with the patients, the staff, the family. So make sure that you have that. The initial assessment is your ABCs, right? Remember the head to toe exam that we talked about? So ABCs, you're starting to do that sample. Everybody remember what sample stands for? Signs and symptoms? History. Right. OPQRST. Those will be important for you. A fat chest coming up, let me let me tell you. Uh, you do the appropriate physical exam, you reassess. Give some comfort and reassurance to the patient, but never lie to them. But don't just come out and say, hey, I think you're going to die. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, reassure that we're doing everything we can. Reassure the family that. Then treat according to your abilities. You should put a star by that because when, when we start, or at least your crew leader should, because when we start the assessments and we get into that, and I want to do a lot, you're going to treat according to your abilities, and your abilities is what you learn in class. All right? Now, you, you're going to treat in class far more than what you're able to do in the hospital. All right? But your abilities is what you learn in, 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 in the classroom. All right? So... This treatment is a big thing. This is something that we're building up towards, and uh, we're just going to start abusing you guys on these assessments. I've downloaded this chest pain little clip. I found it the other day. I think it's pretty cool. We'll watch it. Okay. 
They're both for me. Turn right around and never see it again. Come on, friend. Stand up for me. and also at 300, he converted into 
Y'all ready for that? <laughs> a lot of things take place. You've seen how hectic everything was. And just like I was telling you when we were touring the place, things can get that hectic. They can come in. They had a STEMI. With, yeah, that was yeah. you guys. Yeah. They had a STEMI come in. So if that was the day that we were there, then we would have. it would have been pretty busy. Okay, so what that guy had, I wanted to bring that up. He had what's, what we term as a V-fib seizure. <clears throat> this guy went to ventricular fibrillation, like we talked about, right? And, but when most people go into V-fib, they seem like they're seizing. And that's what that guy did. He had a, a little seizure activity. Did you hear the paramedic say, does he have a history of seizure? Because yeah. he was seizing, but uh, they knew right away, I'm sure that guy did, that uh, he was going into V-fib. That they all do. All the ones that I've seen, that they're talking to you, and then all of a sudden they go into V-fib. They always have that little seizure. They draw up and they seize somewhat a little bit. They get what's called a decorticate posturing, which join the hands upward like this, and, and they seize. <laughs> all right. So chest pain. The guy started out having some chest pain. Called the called 911. Remember, early access, right? Early recognition these things. When we look at cardiac related chest pain, there's some classic signs and symptoms that you that you rule out, that you look at. The first one is obviously chest pain. So if it's cardiac related chest pain, you're going to have the pain, it's called substernal, sub meaning below. All right. So substernal chest pain, and it's usually a pressure type pain. Feels like someone's sitting on you or squeezing you. Huh? So that is primarily, so you can put down here pain localized behind the sternum. You'd want to put down a pressure pain or a squeezing pain. Very important. Uh, you notice in the in the little clip he asked him if he was if it hurt more if he took a deep breath. Those are some, those are questions that you ask to rule out non-cardiac related things. But this guy, just by looking at him in the video, he was clearly having a heart attack. That wasn't a respiratory issue, that was clearly a cardiac issue. Uh, to me it was. I, that would have been the first thing I would have thought of. <coughs> but that one question about, does it hurt more on inspiration, was to rule out some respiratory things. Respiratory type chest pain typically increases with respiration. Cardiac type chest pain is constant. It doesn't change with inspiration or expiration. But the pain may radiate or move into the arms, the back, shoulders, the jaw. So you have this sub substernal chest pain, pressure type pain, constant, that doesn't, <clears throat> that moves into the uh, neck or back, jaws, both arms, left arm, right? so radiating pain as well. Shortness of breath, the patient gets short of breath, he starts having the chest pain and he gets short of breath from the chest pain. Nausea, nausea vomiting, have we talked about the word emesis yet? Emesis, let me see if I can spell it. Emesis is vomiting. It's the medical term for vomiting. 
So, nausea or vomiting, sweating, diaphoresis. So you're getting all these classic signs of a heart attack, and then you get into weakness. Let me tell you, once you have substernal pressure type pain, shortness of breath, remember we're weighing that scale, nausea, boom, heart attack. Heart attack until proven otherwise. So those are the big three. If you're vomiting, nausea and vomiting, then it's almost a, it, it's still a better deal, perhaps, if you're having a heart attack. So you start weighing, like we talked about, you start weighing those signs and symptoms. Weakness, dizziness. But the classic ones are the pressure top pain, shortness of breath, nausea and vomiting. When we start looking at cardiac related pain. This is a term, ACS or acute coronary syndrome, that the American Heart Association came up with some time ago. This is just a blanket uh, term used to talk about uh, really anything is well representing a, a lack of oxygen or ischemia to the heart. That's a new. That's probably a new word for you there. So. Acute coronary syndrome, blanket term used to represent any symptoms related to lack of oxygen to the heart or ischemia, ischemic tissue or lack of oxygen. So make sure that you put that one in your vocabulary that there, you have ischemia or the lack of oxygen for ACS. The other term is cardiac compromise, which is just a huge term with dealing anything wrong with the heart. You have some sort of car cardiac compromise or compromise with the heart. So just a couple of quick vocabulary words for you. When we look at the causes of this compromise, it's usually through a process, a long process, arterial sclerosis, or a narrowing of the artery. So you look at this artery over here, this first one, and that artery is pretty much open, right? I mean, it's got some buildup in it. All of our arteries have some buildup in it because we eat, right? So it's going to have some buildup. Over a period of time, more and more of those big buckets of bluebell that we eat, we start building up more and more uh, plaque in there, more and more constriction, and all of a sudden we get down into here and here. And you can tell from the first one to the last one here, that that would decrease blood flow, correct? That's, that's a no-brainer. More blood flow with the bigger opening, less blood flow with the smaller opening. With the smaller opening, what else are you going to get? More clots. Hmm? More clots. I, I just can't hear you. More clots. No. That's pretty solid. Huh? That's true. Decrease in blood flow, decrease in oxygen. That's good. But what else are we going to get? Good. Pressure. The pressure is going to go up. Blood flow is coming through here. All right. It's going to be under less pressure as blood flow coming through here. You can take a water hose, right, and let the water run out of the hose, right, and some great deal of pressure. You put your thumb over the opening of the hose, and what happens? Yeah, then you get this big stream. It, it increases the pressure over the hole, so you're going to increase the pressure. Those things are two. The lack of oxygen or the lack of blood flow is very important. And then the other thing that's very important is inside that vessel, you're going to increase the pressure. And that's a period of time, this arterial sclerosis is a period of time that's going to lead to the cardiac compromise. That's why we have to make sure that we, we try to eat good, okay, and that we exercise. It keeps this down. It keeps the cholesterol down. Watch what we eat. Diet and exercise. Very important. Or if not, when you get more elderly, you're going to have these problems in here. And then you don't start getting cardiac related top chest pain. The words that they use is angina pectoris 
I don't use this word because I think it's a weird word, okay? But angina pain in pectoris chest. So chest pain. Angina is pain which occurs in the areas of the body with the heart muscle when your heart muscle doesn't get enough oxygen. So you can sort of say the big purple spot here, you get some angina or chest pain, and then that pain could radiate into the arms or neck. Angina pectoris uh, is, or the chest pain, is one of the, the common, very common symptom of, of not getting enough oxygen supply to the blood, I mean, oxygen supply to the heart. And then from that, you get the, the radiating pain. It's got to have, the heart has got to have oxygen. Right. So you have angina pectoris. Doesn't necessarily mean that the patient's having a heart attack, okay? It means that the patient is, has cardiac ischemia, lack of oxygen to the heart, perhaps, and that's what's causing the angina. Everybody good? We're not having a heart attack yet. We're just having angina or chest pain. You have two different types of uh, angina pectoris or chest pain. You have stable and unstable, and the unstable is uh, USA, abbreviated USA, unstable angina. The stable angina is here. You can just sort of see this narrowing and this sort of there's some blockage in there. You guys will learn a lot about this in the cath lab. That's why we go to the cath lab at the hospital. All about this. The guys going in there, they're having some angina they can't explain, some chest pain. If I went to the hospital, by right now, especially my age, I'd go in there, I'm saying, I'm having this chest pain, blah, 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 blah. I'd be heading out to the cath lab. They'd want to cath me to see what's going on inside my heart, what's going on inside those vessels. See if I have this blockage. They might put a stent in there, a balloon. Those are the type of things that you learn in the cath lab. But this is going to cause a decrease in blood flow. A decrease in blood flow or oxygen to the heart is going to cause the heart to react with that type of pain, that pressure type of pain. That's the response that you're going to get. Now, as a progression, what will happen is, well, let me back up. Stable angina is also called predictable. People with cardiac problems have stable angina all the time. And uh, when, when they go out and to mow the lawn, let's say, they don't go out and mow the lawn, they don't do something, activity, they know that they're going to have some chest pain. It's predictable. So they may take a nitroglycerin to open up that vessel before they go out and mow the lawn. So everything's predictable. Stable. Stable angina is also called predictable. So they may go out, they may work. Cardiac people who've had heart attacks or uh, cardiac problems in the past, they just don't quit their jobs and do nothing. So they may go out and work, but they know that if they do a certain type of work, that they're going to develop this angina. So they, they take the natural glycerin for it. We'll learn about that in a few minutes, okay? The other one is unstable <coughs> angina, and it's not predictable. This is when that same patient okay, wakes up in the middle of the night having chest pain. Or he's sitting there watching TV, and they start having chest pain. Like most of the OU fans did this past weekend, right? All them guys were having some chest pain, because they were getting beat down. <laughs> okay, so, it is not predictable, unpredictable. So, the, it, it wakes them up at night, they're sitting there relaxing, there's no reason for them to have the chest pain, and all of a sudden they start having this cardiac type chest pain, unstable. This, stable, they take their nitro, no problem. Pain goes away or they go in and rest. Maybe they don't want to take the nitro, so they'll go out and they'll cut the grass for a little bit, start having some chest pain, they'll come in, they'll rest, 
and the pain will go away. Very stable, predictable. You won't see those guys. You should see these guys when it becomes unstable. That could lead into a heart attack. So these are the guys that say, hey, I woke up in the middle of the night, having this chest pain. You know, I, I take my nitro and it goes away, but I keep waking up or it's just become very unpredictable. The cardiologist, this guy will call his cardiologist. Cardiologist will tell him either to go straight to the hospital or if he's got the chest pain under control, he may just tell him, okay, come in and let's do a cath or let's, let's do some uh, tests and see what's going on. Usually a cath. They start scheduling this type of patient for a cath cardiac cath to, to look, to go inside. Cardiac catheterization is like a, they, they run a, a, a sensor up through the femoral artery and they run it down into the, uh, up the, the vena cava and it gets into the coronary arteries where they're able to look in the coronary arteries. Then they inject dye in there to see if there's any blockage. It's cool. At least the first few times. Huh? Isn't the femoral artery in your leg? Or Fem what? Femoral artery. Yes, yeah, in your leg. Huh? Everybody understand stable and unstable in giant? Everybody good with that? Mm -hmm. Questions? No. Okay. The next thing that you look at is the acute myocardial infarction or AMI, or MI, myocardial infarction, myocardial myo muscle, right? Cardio heart. Infarction is a weird word that uh, means tissue death. Acute, in the, in the medical terms, with, within four hours, or a sudden onset. Acute means sudden onset. It would be like a heart attack within the first four hours or so of having this chest pain would be considered acute. Here, the difference is this clot or something has blocked this artery off and there's either little or no blood flow coming through there. So down here, can you see this gray area? Or do I need to turn off the lights? You can't see it? Okay. See this gray area? That's what they're representing tissue death. And right through here, they're saying this is where the clot is. On this particular heart, all right, this amount of surface area, when you talk about how big or how small the heart attack is, because you guys have heard about, oh, he had a small heart attack, or a big heart attack, massive heart attack. It depends on surface area of the infarction. When the tissue is infarcted, it's dead tissue. It's not coming back. So you get down in here and look at that big gray area, this is going to cause death. If that's that much surface area in the heart, that patient, I say, will die from that heart attack unless they replace the heart. That is a lot of surface area. It's called a high degree block. High degree means up way up high into the coronary artery. A small heart attack would be maybe down in here in this small coronary artery, like on the inferior part of the heart here. Uh, but this is quite a surface area. This is creating tissue death. So if you've got to fix that, you've got to reverse that very quickly, or you're going to have cardiac arrest. But the, the acute MI, or the MI, comes from this clot, you either have a severe decrease in blood flow or a complete stoppage of blood flow to that area of the heart, and that area of the heart is going to die or infarct from the lack the, of no oxygen, lack of or, or no oxygen at all. Everybody good on the definition of a heart attack? Okay. Now the thing about it is... Uh, the signs and symptoms are the same. So you get the signs and symptoms of a heart attack and you're wondering, is this guy having a heart attack or is he just having angina? 
Heart attack and John. Because the signs and symptoms are the same. The big sign and symptoms, or the big thing that is different, if the patient's having a heart attack, the chest pain will probably not go away. So if you give the nitroglycerin, which is a medicine for angina or a heart attack, and the pain doesn't go away, more than likely they're having a heart attack. If the pain goes away with the medication or rest, more than likely it's angina. So that's sort of how you tell the, the differences between the two. But here, again, you get this decrease in blood flow. You get all this nice homemade vanilla uh, coating these arteries, and it's going to decrease this blood flow and decrease oxygen supply to the heart. It's all about the oxygen supply to the heart, okay? The heart has to have its oxygen supply. It gets a very rich oxygen supply off of the aorta. So it, it's, greedy, it's a greedy organ. It wants its uh, blood flow. This will cause some angina. This will cause some chest pain. So this is the type of patient that would go to the hospital having this chest pain that they're going to cath. They're going to take them to the cardiac cath lab and they're going to cath and see what's in there. They may put a stent in there, a stent meaning a little small metal sheath to open up that that vessel, or they may balloon it and open up the vessel. So those are some pretty cool things that you'll see and that you do uh, be around in the cardiac cath lab. And then the clot over here is sort of the same picture as before. Usually this is going to cause sudden death. If you have a big clot like that that forms up, it's going to cause sudden death. Now it could be from a buildup or a what's called a thrombus or an embolism. Maybe this clot broke off somewhere in the body and now it's traveled up and it's lodged in a coronary artery. So that's going to cause an acute MI, an AMI. And you get the, the cardiac, uh, you get tissue death that surrounds it. So, let's, let's look over those signs and symptoms again. Discomfort in the chest, pressure, pain, crushing, feels like someone's sitting on you, all very classic signs. Palpitation. Y'all know what a palpitation is? Not like a, not like palpate, but palpitation. Palpitation. I get palpitations when I go into the, the kitchen. I suspect that there's some leftover ice cream from the day before. And I open the door, and I look, oh, there's the bucket. And I pick up the bucket, and there's a spoonful of ice cream left in there. My heart starts to go. I get palpitations. Or if I drink one of those energy drinks, like you guys drink all the time, I would get palpitations. My heart would do this. All right? So the, uh, those are palpitations. And it may radiate down both arms. One arm or both arms. Classically the left arm, but don't get fooled. It may uh, radiate down both arms. Difficulty breathing or dyspnea. Remember that medical word, right? D-Y-S. Difficult. That weird suffix on it. Nausea, vomiting, or emesis. And this anxiety of impending doom. So true. I can't tell you how many patients I've ran on that they come up, they say, I think I'm having a heart attack. They have all the classic signs and symptoms. And then they say that ugly little phrase to me. What do you think they're going to say? I think I'm going to die. I'm like, oh. no, you just didn't say that. Because the majority of the time, what happens? They die. I mean, it's not very long after that, they like, what, be a little seizure or a little seizure, and boom, checked out. They, it seems like they always, they have this anxiety. But uh, it's a weird thing that the large majority of them, when they say, I think I'm on, unless they're being overdramatic about it, you know. But these guys are laying there, they're, they're not overdramatic, they're sitting in there, and it's a pain, and it's just like going, I think I'm going to die. 
get ready. Because a lot of them do. So they get this anxiety, this feeling of doom. Feel like they're going to die. Got to watch them. Got to be ready. All this, as you should have looked in the video, did you see that progression? That time progression? And then that's important to know. That you went from a time progression of sitting up talking to you to what? To chest compressions in a short amount of time. That I hate when that happens to me. I hate when I'm talking to someone, the next thing I know is that they're, they're unresponsive, they're not talking to me. I'm, 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 a lot of times I'm going to go, no, that's not it. No, oh, cardiac arrest. <laughs> Went my breath at least, it killed you. <laughs> so, vomiting, sweating, you get irregular heartbeats. That's a precursor to someone going into cardiac arrest that usually has a regular heartbeat, a regular pulse rhythm, and all of a sudden they get uh, an irregular beat. Remember uh, paramedic Bob there? He was saying ectopy. Did y'all pick that word up? There's no ectopy. An ectopy is an abnormal, ectopic, where that comes from. Ectopic beat or outside the beat. And, uh, you know, remember when we talked about the SA node and a regular rhythm and that rhythm firing? This would be an irregular rhythm or an ectopic beat. So don't concern yourself too much about that, but uh, you get the ectopy or ectopic beats or the, the pulse rate gets real irregular. All right? And then, last, your blood pressure starts to drop. When the blood pressure starts to drop, that's a sign of cardiogenic shock. And cardiogenic shock is almost always fatal. We'll, we'll talk about that when we talk about the different kinds of shock. But cardiogenic shock is essentially pump failure. The pump has no longer working. The heart muscle is done. And you get that cardiogenic shock. Remember that picture that we looked at just a minute ago with the large surface area gone in the heart? You get that a lot of times, cardiogenic shock from large surface area MIs. Yeah, they, go, they just go in cardiogenic shock. So they start going downhill and they go downhill quickly. All right? So your job depending on what your job is, is to reverse that as it goes down quick. I mean, if you're the doctor, how many of you guys want to be doctors? <laughs> None of you? What happened? I thought some of you want to be doctors. None of you want to be doctors from the beginning. Yes. Yeah, they just quit. Huh? They just quit. They just quit? Yeah. Did you want to be a doctor? Who want to be a doctor from the first day of class you got there and said, I want to be a doctor? Just you? Yeah, me and Jesus. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, you being the doctor, you get this patient in your ER. You have to change that around very quick. You're going to have to reverse that, or you're going to be the one going into the thing, the family. We did everything we could, but the uh, patient died. Right? And that's not a, that's the thing that you don't want to do. So I have this poster over here that says when seconds count, a lot of times it truly is. You've got a short period of time. That's what I love about emergency medicine so much. It's it's on the cutting edge and you have a short period of time to do a lot of stuff, and if you don't do that stuff, there's gonna be a very negative outcome. So the, uh, it's not stressful as much, right? Do you think that would be stressful? When would it be stressful? There's one area where that scenario would be very stressful. What do you think? You're right. You're so smart. Thank you. Maybe that's why you're up front. You're smart. When you don't know what you're doing. 
you get the patient and you don't know what you're doing, you don't know your job, then that would be very stressful. Because that patient's going to die because you don't know what you're doing. That's the only, really only time it becomes stressful. If you know what you're doing and you systematically go through your assessment, all right, then there's not that much stress. You, you guys who are crew leaders, you're going to feel that stress because we're going to kill some patients in here, okay? And it won't be stressful to you if what? You know what you're doing. You know what you're doing, you're going to tell me, oh, another scenario? Okay, right, let's do it. Right? But if you don't know what you're doing, the response is, oh no, another scenario. I feel a little nauseated. Because... You don't want to. You don't want to get up here and not know what you're doing, right? To the. But that's all right. That's why we learn in here. All right. So we look at this cardiac patient immediately. They need help. If no history of heart problems, I have no history of heart problems. If I start having cardiac related chest pain, I go to the hospital. All right. I need to go quick. Huh? Or a history of cardiac uh, problems that the natural glycerin put up to the side. This is one of the medications to relieve the chest pain. Or if you get into a case where you get hypotensive.